Yeah. Hello. Come, on. Come in. Yeah. yeah. How are you? I brought the camera. This is just uh, for my own amusement and amazement. Yeah. I have to get my friend on the video. Oh, yes. I was really in big time in the last two days. I guess you were. Channel 13. Come in here where it's warm. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to show you all these papers. Oh, I'm so excited to see it. You're wildly famous. Oh, you're not such supposed a to get famous before me. Oh, my. I'm ahead of the game. You are way ahead of the game. Today has been such a sort of quiet, it's sort of like a letdown. I know, when, when all the excitement and then suddenly. Yeah, and suddenly it gets quiet. I showed all the one I spoke to the picture of the last president who uh, did not get the electoral vote, Benjamin Harrison, 1888. Then I showed them, I said, what if the states were the same size that they are electorally? How the United States would look if the sizes of states were determined by their electoral votes? See, if a candidate wanted to campaign in these states that are dark, he could win the presidency by just one other state and not campaign in any of the others. That wouldn't be fair, would it? No. So he'd get 246 votes in these states, and he'd just have to carry Missouri or maybe Alabama and win the presidency. So, so that's that. So why, tell me again what your reason was for you believe we need the Electoral College still. Why can't oh. we just go with the pop? Okay. Vote? The popular vote might lead to the election of some radical or someone who uh, really isn't meant, isn't intended to be president because he might represent maybe such a one-sided view that he just cares enough states to win. But the Electoral College is the buffer between the popular vote by the people and uh, electing a king or a dictator. And in the early days, in 1787, they didn't want to do that because their experience with England was such that they didn't want uh, anything like they'd had before. Right. You see? Right. Now, so. <coughs> uh, I was in reading all these papers. I'll just show you this one in the Asheville Citizen. The Asheville Citizen said, Meanwhile, Wednesday, Western North Carolina's representative in the Electoral College, Joe Morgan of Madison County, said he'll go to Raleigh in December and reflect the mountain people's vote. But uh, he'll do so with the belief that the Electoral College system that was so critical in the Bush Gore election might be an out of date system that needs to be changed. Now, then I'm quoting Abandon, quote, Abandoning it would cause more activity and campaigning and competition bet uh, because we don't need 15 or 20 states where a presidential candidate uh, er never goes because he knows he will not win those states. Now, for instance, like Kansas. Kansas goes Republican every year. Right. Well, why does the Democrat want to go to Kansas? He won't get anywhere. The Republican will win it. The Bob Dole will win it. Bush will win it. All the rest of them will win it. Right. So you see, that's the way it is. So what, do you think any changes need to be made then? Uh, I, I think that we, I really think that we should uh, go back to the system whereby uh, we let the people decide so there'd be competition in each state because I think we've graduated to that point now. Now, in the past, I wouldn't have favored that, right. but I think in the future it'd be a good idea. Is this the most unusual electoral process you have witnessed oh, in yes. your life? Most unusual I've ever known of. It was more unusual than it was in 1948. Now, in 1948, uh, we had an election in which Henry Wallace ran for president. He had been Secretary of Agriculture and Vice President. Uh, Harry Truman ran, and he had been Vice President and President. And the other one who ran was Strum Thurmond of South Carolina, Governor of South Carolina. Now, he ran on the state's rights ticket, and he won four southern states, and he got about 39 electoral votes. So, you see, it was very close. But as far as going back and all the recounts... Oh, I think that's the great... Uh, I think that's to be avoided at all, if at all possible. And I think we should count the votes just as they are and not go to court and have recounts and then another recount. Karen Hughes, Mr. Bush's uh, 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 able assistant, was so good. She said, we had one recount in Florida and w Bush, Bush won it. We had another one now and Bush has won it. So what else? Are they going to count the, the ballots over and over until they're satisfied and happy with the outcome? 
Right. Oh, that's just like going on. So here I am today, and it's just as quiet. So tell me, give me a brief recap of when the media frenzy began with you, and which newspapers it included, and which reporters you were most impressed with and why. Oh, that's a good question. I began Monday. Monday morning uh, at 10 o'clock, I got a call from uh, uh, Mr. Barber of the Asheville, of the WLOS TV. He said, Joe, I'll be here about 1 o'clock to interview you for uh, about the Electoral College and about your participation in it in Raleigh in December, etc. I said, I'll be ready. So about 1 o'clock, I heard, I saw WLOS come in. He and his assistant brought the cameras and all in. They backed on the door. And I said, come in. So we went. I took him a tour on the tour of the house. He really liked all these books. And he asked some good questions. And he had studied and knew what he was talking about. So we sat down in there. And he asked me a lot of questions. And I knew the answers to all of them. Because I had just called Dr. Stern about an hour before at Marshall College, professor of political science. And I said, Dr. Stern, I read once where it said the Electoral College was really a compromise between the wishes of the Founding Fathers who wrote the, Const wrote the convention, uh, Constitution in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention and the Congress. And he, th he thought of it and he said, no, it's not really a compromise. The Congress didn't have much to do with it except the Constitutional Convention said the Senate, each state would have two senators and each uh, state would have as many representatives as they have people. Now like Vermont, it just has uh, about 150,000 people, but it still has a congressman. But this district, uh, Charles Taylor represents 600,000 people. Right. So you see, yeah, little Vermont would never vote to get rid of the Electoral College because they're pleased with their power. New York might want to get rid of it because they have all these representatives, but they're losing two in this next census. And so I think uh, efforts will be made to get rid of it. Uh, Hillary Clinton said she's going to get rid of it. But look here. In history, 100 people, 100 efforts have been made to change the Electoral College. But none have succeeded. Why? It takes two-thirds of the Congress, House and Senate, to ratify any change. And it takes three-fourths of all the states to approve the amendment. So it'll be a high, it's a high standard. So I doubt if it'll ever be changed. Certainly not in the next four years. Okay. Now tell me about all the newspapers that have come. Oh. I've and what, how did... Mentioned that too. said he's elected because he's worked in the party a long time. That's the way you get elected. You don't get elected by being here just a year or two. You have to work in the party 15, 20 years to get elected to national convention or presidential elector. So, um... How did you get elected? Okay, that's the question he asked me. Uh, Cheryl Barber, Barber, Cheryl has been with him a long time. He said, how did you get elected? I said, I was elected from the 11th Congressional District at T.C. Robertson High School in May by all the delegates from 15 counties who assembled there for the purpose of electing three delegates to the National Convention and one presidential elector and three alternates to the National Convention. I said, I was elected by the people. I was not appointed. Okay. Oh, he said, that's even more impressive. I said, hundreds of people voted for me. I said, Colonel Jesse Ledbetter, former state senator, uh, nominated me. Dedrick Brown of Mars Hill seconded my nomination. And I said, uh, Representative uh, Gillespie of McDowell County was standing in wait in case I needed an extra person to nominate me, and Representative Lanier Kanzler, who was at the meeting last night that I spoke to, he was ready to nominate me. And tell me about the newspaper. When did they, which was the first newspaper that called? The first newspaper that called me was the Charlotte Observer. I believe it was the day after the election. And the Charlotte Observer, the lady, asked me a lot of questions, so like what you've asked. But she never did ask me if anyone had made overtures to me to get me to vote for Gore or somebody else. But uh, later, when the lady called from London, she called twice. And the first time, she asked regular, ordinary, historical questions. Then she called back and she said, I forgot something. I said, oh, go right ahead. She said, has anyone tried to get you to vote for someone other than George W. Bush? 
I said, no, ma'am. And I said, it wouldn't do any good if they did, because in North Carolina, this is one of the 24 states where you must vote for the one you say you'll vote for before the convention. You have to vote for the nominee of the party. And I said, furthermore, I'm committed to him, and I wouldn't consider voting for anyone else anyway. Okay, now, did she tell you how she got your phone number? Oh, they they called, uh, I'll tell you another thing, the, uh, someone called from Austin, Texas, and talked to Mr. Robert Long, a very prominent lawyer in Asheville, who helped Mr. Taylor with all of his tax problems. Right. And he said, uh, do you know Joe Morgan? He said, sure, I've known him for about 30 years. And he kept asking questions, and he wondered why he was asking so many questions. He said, what kind of fellow is he? Can he be dependent on? Is he reliable on him? And, the, and he said, you know, he's a presidential elector, and Robert almost forgot about it. Said, oh, yes, I remember he is. Oh, he said, you'd have to shoot him to get him to vote for anybody else. He said, he wouldn't vote for anybody except George Bush. He's a long-time loyal Republican. He said, there's no doubt who will you vote for. I, I shook hands with him, and I patted him on the back. I said, thank you for that. But I said, I knew he was working with the Bush camp. That was good. I don't plan to change and vote for anybody else. That's silly. No one can bribe me to vote for someone whom you think I'd face all these people around uh, my home and in all the district, and then someone say, "Oh, he voted for Al Gore." That's heresy. Yeah. That's uh, worse than hypocrisy. That's oh, that's terrible. Well, how did the woman from the London Times get your? Oh, phone she number? got it. She called the United States. She called up. Uh, uh, the State Department, and they had all these, and uh, in Washington, she said, I believe it was in Washington State Department, then to confirm it, she called the Secretary of State of North Carolina, and they gave him my name. I've, all the people who've called me, most of them call the Secretary of State's office, and they have my name, and they're to send me, uh, Mr. Barber asked me yesterday if I'd seen, received my plaque yet. I said, no, they'll send them a little closer to the time we go to Raleigh. They're to send me a plaque indicating I'm the presidential elector. I'll let you be the first to see it. Great. Now, when do you go to Raleigh? I go the 18th of December, which is on a Monday. We go to the old state house, the 14 electors, right there. And we vote for president. <clears throat> and I got a call about two weeks ago from former governor. What was it? Did I hear someone? I did. I heard someone outside. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. Whew. Okay. And so the lady from London called first. She says, this is Mrs. Seemed like Mrs. Small or Smalls, Smalling or something from London. And I said, oh, I first told her that I didn't like Tony Blair too much. He's the prime minister. I said, the reason is I watch him on C-SPAN. And he's always attacking his... Uh, the leader of the conservative party, and I said, that's unnecessary because, you know, uh, he's doing his job, and why doesn't he stick to issues instead of, uh, he's not in a campaign, so why is he always talking? She said, I agree with you on that. So she asked me all kinds of questions about the Electoral College, how I got interested, what I'd done all my life, why I was interested in today, and what would my feeling be when I go to Raleigh, and all I could. I said, I've been for Bush, I'm for Bush, I will be for him, and even if he defeated, I'm still for Mr. Bush. So. So that was that. And so she didn't, uh, she, she knew that I was thoroughly committed. And then when uh, the Charlotte Observer, I have it here somewhere, but I can't find it. They quoted me as saying never. They asked me if I'd ever vote, consider voting for somebody else. I said never, never. So it's in the Charlotte Observer. It's in this pack, but I, uh, anyway. This over here is the actresses, but they quoted me as never, and I was first one quoted of all the delegates, all the one, because they liked my definite answer that no one can induce me to vote for anyone except Governor George W. Bush. Now, um, will you be quoted in the London Times? Oh, yes, yeah, she'll have it there. Now, what I want to do, I want to get to a bookstore in Asheville and some place. I'm going to find out where I can get that. Yeah. I don't have that copy yet, but I'll, I'll get it because it's in there. She had the longest interview of any. Charlotte Observer seemed like it was about five minutes. The Gastonia Gazette, the lady knew more about history than anyone who talked with me. 
She even knew, as I knew, that two states do not employ the Electoral College per se like the others do. For instance, Maine and, and Nebraska, you know what they do? If you win the whole state, they don't, they don't go by that. You have to win the district. There are two congressional districts. If you won one, di or one district, you get one electoral vote. If you lose the other one, then in the state of Maine, you don't get four votes, you just get three. In Nebraska, they have three congressional districts. One is represented, I happen to know, because his famous coach, Bill Osborne. He coached out in basketball. Oh, he was, I heard him for years. He won in the uh, third district, got nearly 80% of the vote as a Republican. And he, he, he was so popular that nobody wanted to run against him. But anyway, if uh, in Omaha, if they win the third congressional district, the Republicans, and uh, lose the other two, then they just get the two votes for the senators, and that one vote, three votes instead of five. See, they would get fat. Now, what about voting irregularities in Madison County? Oh, that's a long story, but let me let me tell you what about the election of 1964. In 1964, in the first Democratic primary in Madison County, it was so corrupt and so crooked that the State Board of Elections came and sat in Marshall where the judge sits in the courtroom for weeks. And they had hundreds and hundreds of people going across the stage. They would put their left hand on the Bible and raise their hand. And the, the questioners, the lawyers, would say, Mr. So-and-so, did you vote on Election Day in the primary in May 1964? No, I didn't vote. I was working. I worked in the, on the farm. I went fishing. I did all this. But it's recorded. It's recorded in the book that you voted. Someone forged my name. I didn't vote. Then the next one. Uh, put their hand up then, or their hand on the Bible and hand up. Uh, Mrs. Jones, did you vote on election day uh, on the primary of May so-and-so, 1964? No, sir, I did not vote that day. I was busy. I went to visit my sister in uh, Marion or somewhere. I wasn't there. And hundreds and hundreds did that, and it was fraudulent. See, Zeno Ponder ran for county, I mean for state senate, which covered several counties. In those days, it covered these counties, Madison, Yancey, Mitchell, and McDowell. And in McDowell, uh, there was a fellow who ran against a Mr. Ponder. And he got the most votes because Mr. Ponder only got and manufactured a big vote in Madison County, stole it. The other counties he didn't get, but just, you know, so he didn't win. And the State Board of Elections approved it to be fraudulent from beginning to end. And Mr. Joe Huff, who used to practice law, he doesn't practice much now. He's up in years. His son Stephen practices now. Stephen won, incidentally, a Moorhead Scholar. He was a mm -hmm. Moorhead Scholar. But anyway, Mr. Huff helped them, and they found it fraudulent from beginning to end. So, to make a long story short, you may say, what happened? In my precinct here, a uh, fellow up on Grapevine, they kicked him out. He was a registrar. They kicked him out. All the registrars in the county kicked out. All the Board of Elections, Madison County, Democrats were all kicked out because they found it to be fraudulent from beginning to end. And the results were set aside. They had a second primary in which they had an honest election. And James Ramsey up on East Fork was our judge down here, our uh, registrar down here. He's a fine man and everything went along fine. My uncle on Great Van, Joel Morgan, before he died, he helped him in the election. And Bobby Jean Peake and I, Dr. Bobby Jean Peake Rice and I, the one that got bit with the dog when she's doing census. Right. Very fine lady. She retired as, uh, she was in the county school system. She was there. Uh, she'd go around to all the teachers and give them advice and help them, give them pencils and paper, all kinds of things they needed. She was uh, called the, uh, not superintendent, she was right below the superintendent. Anyway, we were to help the illiterates. So a lot of the illiterates would come in, and there's a lady running for state representative who defeated uh, Liston in the fall election, and her name was on there, and it said, Mrs. Frances C. Ramsey. He said, oh, she's Heather Welker. Well, see, we weren't supposed to go into detail as to what they were and what they weren't. We are just supposed to read them out and say, do you wish to vote for Miss Ramsey? So, oh, yeah, I want to vote for her. But see, she was not head of the welfare. There was a lady, Mrs. Florence Ramsey, was head of the welfare. So a lot of the illiter illiterates voted wrong. That convinced me that they don't add much to the elective process. And poor old Junior White that I knew for years used to walk all the way around Marshall. He's from Grapevine. 
he voted wrong, and he saw the name of Mr. Wade Huey. He could read enough to see Wade Huey. Oh, I know him. Uh, that's Wade Huey. I'm going to vote for him. I said, we're good. I'll vote for him. But he voted for, uh, they uh, voted for a lot of them that they didn't know who they were voting for. But Mrs. Francis C. Ramsey won by 1,400 votes and defeated Liston, the only time Liston's ever been defeated since 1960, and he's just now retired. So this has been a landmark election yes, in many ways. Yes, and the Republicans held on for six years. The Democrats didn't win anything in Madison County from 64, 66, or 68. They finally got back in a little bit, and Zeno sort of kept his head down down for so long and was so embarrassed and humiliated by what happened. But 1970, they sort of tried to come back out from the rocks and won, and they stayed in and did pretty well till 86. Then uh, Dedrick Brown won for sheriff in 86, and Judge Baker won head of the Board of Education, so the Republicans were in control there for about four years. Then they were out from 90 to 94, then they got in control in 94 and stayed in 98. So you see, it's been a sort of a sketchy, the political system here has been uh, up and down, and the Republicans and Democrats in and out, changing offices, because there's been uh, conflicting uh, uh, views of how their service has been and so forth. But Madison County has been a real patchwork of political activity, but most of it from 1950, 50 when Zeno's crowd got in, to about 86, they were mostly in control except those six years. And while they were in control, uh, the people, uh, only ones who could, get, who could get jobs, we had to be, they'd go check and see if they were Democrat. See, that's not good. And most of the good school teachers left the county. And what, when was that in this? That was from 50 to uh, 86, with the exception of 64 to 70. Okay, did you notice any voting irregularities this year? Uh, when I was watching at Hot Springs, I noticed this. A certain person down there uh, was overly aggressive in trying to help people vote. And he wouldn't grab him by the arm like he did two years ago, and they said he he voted for voted one fellow twice two years ago. So that's why I was down there watching, from when they opened to one o'clock. By that time, uh, Sheriff Brown said, "You can tell he'll learn. He better watch because this is a federal election, and he could get put in jail." Well, this fellow would go up to him and say, oh, "Hi, Mr. So-and-so. How are you? It's just so good to see you." And so I pat him on the back, and before he knew it. Uh, they'd say, will you help me? And they went in and helped him vote. Well, it was the uh, only thing that made it legal was that he had uh, he had more or less asked them to do it by being so friendly and so rushing up to him. And then they sort of hated to say they go in by themselves. But uh, several went in and had him to help them vote. He's not, not really supposed to do that. That's why I didn't call the fellow FBI agent. Judge Briggs had given me an FBI agent number in Asheville. They were going to be here to watch the election. Also, uh, Forrest Ball, an attorney, he doesn't practice much now. He stays at his home on Sweetwater Road. But he used to be the county attorney, and he ran for judge, different things, when he's more active. He said, Joe, I'll be glad to help you in time during the day. Should something come up, you just call me. So I had two numbers, and I sat there all that time. And I, I saw a lot of people that I knew. And I saw, this is interesting. You didn't know her, but Mrs. Betsy Powell Gardner and her husband, who made their wealth, through computers and so forth. They have a big mansion uh, at the end of Lewis Branch on Big Laurel. Well, I was sitting there and suddenly I saw them come into the Hot Springs precinct. I thought, that's strange. I didn't know, but they had built a home down near Paint Rock in Hot Springs and they were registered in Hot Springs. And they, she told me, she'd been a good friend of mine for years, and she told me they also have a home in Knoxville. Wow. Very wealthy. Mm -hmm. Betsy Power Gardner. And so what I want to do, the reason she became disaffected with the Republicans was because she found irregularities over on Laurel. She was eating in Johnson City one evening, and she saw a lady that she had seen vote in Laurel. And she asked her, where do you live? I live in Flag Pond, Tennessee. See, and she took that to uh, Harold uh, Howard Riddle and their Board of Election, and that woman, it caused a big to-do, and they had a hearing in the courtroom. Oh, she got after him. So this last time, I went to Laurel after at 1 o'clock to check on things. Mr. Brackens, who was in charge, was the most delightful fellow, and Mrs., uh, uh, the lady that I read in this book about the victims, I have it here somewhere, 
uh, of the Laura Mesco, she was there. Uh, Mrs. Glendora Cutshaw, the wife of the late Clarence B. Cutshaw, who ran for Board of Education several years ago and had a store over there. And I talked with her, and they were running along very well, and they were quite busy. And the school was being built there, and it was just things were just a lot of activity going on. It was real nice. But Hot Springs, all the time I was there, it sort of it was sort of like the uh, holla. It seemed holla. It seemed like everyone was so quiet, and it just barely went in. They'd, they'd talk to them, just whisper, and they voted, and out they went. It was eerie, scary, and it seemed like they were afraid or something. So I, 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 uh, I made no complaints after I left, except I did tell the Board of Elections one thing. See, that little ponder that fell down there it used to be on the Board of, of Education, and he'd tell little silly jokes that were stupid and uh, people wouldn't even laugh. He's not well known for his... But anyway, uh, one of our Republicans went to, and wanted to work in the polls, and he uh, criticized him and said, no, you go home. He did let him vote, though. And they uh, talked to mean to him. And I told the Board of Elections about it, and they didn't like that. They said you should greet everyone and treat them. They said, uh, said something like goofy or silly or something, you know. Talk to him mean. And that wasn't too good. That's the only real irregularity uh, down there that I knew anything about. But so, they're doing better. So why... Why is it that in uh, mountain communities like Madison County are so politically divided? Well, I'll tell you why. Zeno Ponder and his crowd politicized it years ago for so many years that it's hard to get over. They're still lingering from the effects of it. And that was everything was thought in political terms. Uh, a big uh, university started to, uh, came here and was going to settle in the beautiful mountains around... Uh, uh, Laurel River. They were found a place up there. They wanted to scoop out and and landscape and and uh, have a university there. Granted, it was a little uh, offbeat university. It was the Maharaja and the uh, they believed in the, uh, extra sense perception and in uh, sort of doing the cocktail and doing uh, uh, what is this uh, that they do? They carry flowers and they work for peace and they uh, they meditate and they get on the knees and so forth and. Uh, Guess what the county commissioners in Zeno said at that time? Oh, sir, we'll be glad to have your university to establish her and all like that, but said you have to give us a kickback. They do. They you know where they went? They went to Idaho, where they wanted to be in the mountain scene, where it was serene, where there was pristine forests and beauty. They wanted. They believed in all these wonderful things, extra good environment, all like that. But everyone who wasn't any business or, or never it shied away from Madison County because of the bad politics. They had politics in their schools. And you ask that question, here's another answer to it. The schools were seeped with politics. Every teacher who taught there at the end of the year, they would be approached by someone who say, oh, now you've got to give so much to the campaign kitty of the Democratic Party, whether they were Democrat or not. So a lot of them objected. And they'd say, well, you know what that means, don't you? So two teachers, I remember, said this. One was Miss Daughter at Hot Springs who lived in the what is now the inn years ago, and I knew her well. She ran the bookmobile all over the She said, well, if they don't let me teach schools, so that I might learn to raise chickens and sell the eggs and do a little farm work, and I might try to find another job and do something else. And she just smiled. She said they were, they were so arrogant. So, oh, you've got to give them the campaign now they never mention that. It's not been mentioned for several years because uh, some new leaders said, oh, you don't do that. You don't sell school position. And so the good teachers would leave. Now I'll give you an example. There's a Mrs. Earhart at Mars Hill. She's a fine English teacher. She gave me a book on uh, Upper Laurel. Let's see if I have it here. Long time ago, she gave me this little book on Upper Laurel. Oh, yeah. And she is now in way up in her 80s, and she lives in uh, near in Kenilworth, Kenilworth uh, on the Kenilworth Place, Kenilworth Forest in Asheville, right. near the hospital. And so she uh, one day she was up in Asheville, and uh, she saw a principal up there, Mr. Hall, and she began to cry. And he said, "Why, well, Miss Earl, what's wrong with you? What what's wrong? Who hurt your feeling?" She said, "Oh, 
and Mars, uh, Zeno's crowd said that I couldn't teach him or said I hadn't done right, hadn't contributed to campaign kitty and hadn't and didn't belong to their party, didn't vote for them, didn't do as they should, you know. He said, don't worry about that. I'll get you a school right up here and you teach up here. So before she got through up there and before she retired, guess what? She was the head of the reading program of the whole county. She was in charge of a lot of things and just did real well. So when they leave here, they go to greener pastures and do better. Well, so what? why is it, though, historically, when did... It started in 1950. That's when Zeno came back from, uh, uh, he was doing this chemical work over at the, uh, over in Tennessee. Where's that place, uh, that scientific place there that uh, World War II, they experimented uh, right beyond Knoxville over there. He came back here and he decided that since Madison was all Republican then, and the state was Democrat, he said we wouldn't get as much money from the state or do all this and that. So he tried to make the county Democrat. Well, in the process, they made a lot of enemies, and they had a lot of uh, suits in court, and all like that, and uh, it became, made it very divisive, and everyone thought of politics as, they're going to do this now, they thought of the political angle of it, they got too conscious of politics, everything is politics, it was absorbed, absorbed in politics, the state chairman one time sued Zeno, and down at Marshall, they were in the courtroom, one night, courthouse one night, and they came out, and guess what? Someone had sneaked around and put stuff on their windshield so they couldn't see, couldn't get off. It's sticky stuff, and they couldn't, get, they like, they never got home. And you know, they're always doing tricks and things. Oh, it's terrible. They, everything else is sort of makes you ready for it. That's right. You're, <laughs> you've, you've really hardened up as a, as a well-known movie person. <laughs> you, you are very relaxed. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, so why are you a Republican? Okay. I'm a Republican by philosophy, by belief, by background, and uh, uh, by tradition. Uh, I'll tell you an experience. When I was in service in Hawaii, supposedly serving my country, I read in the news record that used to be the only paper back then, that was in the 50s, okay. in the mid-50s, I read in the news record, uh, even though I was not registered at that time, I registered after I got out of service. But I read in the news record that Joe Morgan voted twice. He voted in the primary in the fall election. They didn't have enough sense or something to know that I might read the paper or take, just because I was in Hawaii, they thought I wouldn't read. And not only was I not registered, but they voted for me, the Democrats. That's the Ponderites. That's what they did. That was part of the pattern. So when I came back, I uh, got out of service and came back and went to Marshall, I said, I'm going to go register. So when I went in, the young lady in there said, her eyes, I never will forget her eyes got big. She said, Mr. Morgan, you're already registered. I said, no, I have never registered. I want to register now the way I want to. So she looked and they had me registered Democrat. I told her, tear that up, and I registered Republican. I, that uh, The Zeno Ponder helped me a little to be a Republican, but I was Republican even before that because I was a Republican by background, uh, and my family tradition and experience and beliefs and ideas because I believe that republicanism, I did at that time and still do, <clears throat> I believe that republicanism is synonymous with national integrity and fiscal soundness. I like that aspect of the republican philosophy and republican ideals. So that's partly why I'm Republican. And in Madison County, I always want to be Republican to oppose the bad situation that I find here. Um, do you believe that being a Republican um, is less government control? Yes, they don't believe in as much many government programs, and you know uh, the the Democrats believe that any program comes along, they want to start it, and they they never knew a program they didn't want to finance or or have, and so forth. Re Republicans believe in less government interference with their lives. And uh, the government should do only for the people what they cannot do for themselves. So that's why I'm a Republican. But in Madison County, I would always re vote Republican anyway to counteract the bad influence of the other party. Uh, I have to tell you, when I was chairman in 1971-73, I put an ad in against Zeno. Here's what it said. Under Zeno's leadership, or lack of leadership, Madison County has become the county of the dreadful night, of the closed society, and a county in which 
you have no right to or you have no access to getting jobs or anything unless you're a member of the party in power. And I said, that's not true de not true democracy. I said, in fact, it reminds me of the uh, Third Reich of Germany, where someone may at any time be pecking on your door and you may be a victim. You might, uh, if you do cross their path, to do things against them. And I said, furthermore, Zeno and his crowd remind me of the biblical uh, statement about the plague of frogs and flies. And I compared Zeno to Hitler and the, the, the smaller dictators such as Castro. Oh, Dr. Stern was here then. He hadn't been here long. He thought that was so funny. So, <laughs> did you vote a straight Republican ticket? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I won, only one time did I ever almost vote Democrat. That's in 1978 when uh, a, a banker from Charlotte ran against Jesse Helms. And he was the son of former Governor Hodges. And he was such a fine person, I almost voted for him. But then I thought that uh, Jesse Helms, I thought he's going to be continue his good philosophy of conservatism. I liked a lot that he stood for, so I finally decided to vote for him. But I almost voted for Mr. Hodges. Incidentally, Dr. Bentley of Marshall College was his campaign chairman in Madison County, Mr. Hodges. And he knew also that he's a very fine person. Okay. But on the county level, I've never seen any Democrat I would vote for. Okay, so when did you get interested in politics? I got interested in politics when uh, I was in high school in uh, the 1949, 1950, along there. I will recall when Z uh, Zeno Ponder's brother, Sheriff uh, Ponder, uh, was supposedly elected by three votes in 1950, and Dr. W.A. Sams was supposedly elected by three or four votes, and they took to the state Supreme Court. And since they didn't find any evidence that they were elected, the chief, the associate justice of the state supreme court then was guess who? Sam J. Irwin of Watergate fame, later of Watergate. Fame. And so he in nineteen that's nineteen fifty. And Watergate was nineteen seventy three. That was twenty two years later. He wrote and said, well, he thought that there might be enough evidence in the two or three precincts. Certain things happening. So. Yeah, the upshot was he sort of thought they won, but he didn't really say it for sure. He was he was sort of a ambiguous anomaly there, and so they got in. And once they got in, they tried to keep the county democratic for a while. <clears throat> okay, and so you got interested in politics in high school. Yes, I've always been interested in politics. What is it that interests you? I was interested in politics in 1944 when I was a kid down here at Center School because the air principal, Mr. Uh, uh, Roberts had us to discuss the Roosevelt's election. And I said, old Roosevelt, and he said, what'd you say? I said, that old Roosevelt got elected. I was interested even then. It, so you were like? When I was just about 12 or 13. And once you became interested in politics? I've never lost the interest. It's been a life, uh, lifelong interest and a lifelong uh, passion. And what do you find interesting about politics? I find about politics, what is interesting is the uh, combativeness of the candidates and the flo uh, the clash of ideas and principles and the beliefs and so forth and the uh, uh, background and standards of the candidates and the philosophy of the different parties. And so all of your family is Republican. Oh, uh, let me see. Frank Jr. over there it is. Now, Dr. Monroe, I think he leans sort of toward the Democrats because he liked Al Gore. Because he's from Tennessee, and of course he, you'd see why he liked. But he's more Democrat. But uh, I had an older brother who's a strong Democrat. But all the rest of them, most of them are Republican. So it's been a family history. Mostly a family history. history. My late father was appointed by Lyndon Johnson, the head of the Madison County Draft Board. Of course, Johnson may never have known he was appointed because he's on the county level. But he did vote for